Well, welcome everyone to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Trinity Assembly of God. We're so excited to have you with us. And we're uh, in a, an exciting series that's based on a, a very exciting book, I think, that is foundational to our understanding of Christianity as a whole and the Christian ideal. And it's the fact that we were made to be God's dwelling place. The book is titled The Indwelling Life of Christ, All of Him in all of me. And so this past week we've studied on the introduction and now we're focusing on the first chapter of this book. And in just a little bit, I'll share with you how you can get a free complimentary copy of this book, uh, Compliments of Trinity, right at the end of our study today. So this first chapter, I call it the imagination chapter because it begins with the word imagine. So we're using our imagination as he tells a, a fable, a, a, a bit of a story or parable. I call it an alien allegory. I call it the sci-fi chapter, and it's very different from all of the rest of the chapters in the book. But it paints a picture. And it's a picture of God having created uh, a, a species on another planet uh, that, again, were made by God because all things are made by God. Yet they didn't know God personally. And they'd heard about a group of people that were made in the image of God, man that was made in the image of God on a little blue planet. And so they were so excited and they entered their spacecraft and took the long journey to come to earth so they could observe man and find out what God was like only to be disillusioned by what they witnessed. Because as you and I know, they were seeing fallen humanity. They were seeing man that had been marred, the very image of God that had been marred in men. And they were shocked and they were horrified at many of the things that they had seen. And they entered back into their ship and they went back discouraged and disappointed to their faraway planet. So I called it the sci-fi chapter. And uh, it has a little bit of a sci-fi ring to it. Um, you know, they're aliens. We can translate alien extraterrestrial. But you know the word alien can also mean a foreigner. It can mean a stranger. That word alienated is used in the Bible. Uh, it means to be estranged, separated, withdrawn, isolated from God. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, it speaks uh, of the new man. In verse 17, this I say, Paul wrote, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. Now, the Gentiles were alienated from the very life of God, and that describes all of us before we came to Christ in our lost condition. In Ephesians 2.12, says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. That's the lost world around us being described. And it describes us again before we came to Jesus. We were without Christ. We were aliens from God. Uh, we were without God in this world. In Colossians 1.21, it says, And you once, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. So all of us know what it's like to be looking for the image of God, to be without Jesus Christ, without God in the world, alienated from the Lord. And there's multitudes around us that are alienated from God, and they need to see God, and they need to see him through you and I. Now, this deals with creation and God making man in his image. He built us and designed us for a purpose, and that is that he can live through us and manifest his life to this world through you and I, made in his image to be his dwelling place. The scriptures in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, let me read it. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and all, over all the earth, 
and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And listen very carefully to verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We have the account of God's creation of man. Now, evolution doesn't leave creation or man out of the picture. Evolution leaves God out of the picture. And it shows a disrespect for God and it dishonors God. And there are five things that are said in this biblical account of creation that you're not going to find in evolution, that flies in the face of evolution. Five things that God is involved in one way or another. First of all, man's design. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Now, this kills the idea of evolution. The evolutionary idea that man came from monkeys and evolved over so many years is absolutely destroyed by this single solitary verse of Scripture, the true account in the Word of God of man being created. Uh, even the monkeys got together and decided that they objected to this idea. I read this little piece earlier today. Three monkeys sat in a coconut tree discussing the things that are said to be, said one to another, now listen, you two, there's a certain rumor that can't be true, that man descended from our noble race. Why, the very idea, it's a disgrace. No monkey ever deserted his wife, starved her babies, or ruined her life, nor did you ever know a mother monkey to leave her babies with others to bunk or pass them on to one another till they scarcely knew who, their, who was their mother. And another thing you'll never see, a monkey built nest around a coconut tree and let the coconuts go to waste, forbidding all of the monkeys to have a taste. Why, if I built a fence around a coconut tree, starvation would cause you to steal from me. Here's another thing that a monkey won't do. Go out at night and get on a stew or use a gun, a club, or a knife to take another monkey's life. Yes, man descended the ornery cuss, but brother, he didn't descend from us. So even the monkeys object to the idea that man came from monkeys. For many years, man has been trying to make a monkey out of himself. The problem is we've got a bunch of monkeys with blowtorches today that have the capacity of destroying mankind. So the first thing is that you see man's design, man's design. He designed man. There is a designer, and, and, and his name is God. And then you see man's designation, male and female, he created them. Now this flies in the face of the idea that he's created us as homosexuals or transsexuals. And, and we know that there is a lot of confusion in our day, and like no other day with some 70 different types of uh, transgender identities to select from and uh, the LGBTQI and growing concept of so many different kinds of odd and strange uh, sexual identities. The Bible simply designates male and female. And all of these other things are perversions, and I say that with a tenderness, but they're perversions upon God's original creation. He made man and he made woman. He made male and he made female, and that's all there is to this day, but there's a lot of confusion that's being sown. You see man's design. He was made in God's creation. You see man's designation. There's male and there's female, and then you see man's duty. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish or fill the earth. Now, this flies in the face of the abortionists, and it addresses the subject of abortion. Abortion is not in the plan of God. God wanted Adam and Eve to reproduce children and to populate the earth. And this whole idea of population explosion isn't a problem for God. God can provide for however many human beings occupy this planet if we'll simply trust him and believe him. He is more than adequate to take care of the population. We don't need to be thin in the herd. With some 60 million abortions in America alone, down through the last 30, 40 years, it's tragic, friends. So you see man's designation. He's made in the image of God. 
And you see uh, he's made male and female. And you see his duty to multiply and to replenish the earth. And you see his dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Man is designed to rule creation, not creation rule man. And this, again, flies in the face of your animal rights advocates since many of your environmentalists that wants to put creation above man, that wants to put Mother Earth, so to speak, above man that God made and placed on earth to rule and to have dominion over the earth. The animal kingdom and all the creation here on earth is to be subject to man, not the other way around. And then the fifth thing, which you're probably not going to like, is uh, man's diet. Uh, God said, I've given you every herb bearing seed, every tree in which is the fruit of a tree. To you it shall be meat or food. So we understand, as with the animals, uh, God made man basically as a vegetarian to eat from the fruits and to eat from the vegetables and eat from the grains, that which was produced by seeds or uh, produced by trees and so forth. It wasn't until Adam came along after the flood that God added meat to the diet. So I'm not saying you've got to be a vegetarian or a vegan, uh, but I'm telling you, friends, we probably would do ourselves a, a world of good if we laid off the meat a little bit and focus a little bit more <laughs> on the grains and on the vegetables. Uh, put those grains and those veggies on your plate. But you see it, man's design and his designation and his duty and his dominion and even his diet is outlined for us in these two verses of scripture. Now, as I was thinking about this, I thought how that this addresses all of the mis comment, mistakes and the misrepresentations and false teachings and philosophies and ideologies and worldviews that dominate our culture. It flies in the face of evolution. It flies in the face of the sexual perversions. It flies in the face of abortion. It flies in the face over uh, the dominion, having creation, having dominion over man, rather than man having dominion over creation, and even deals with our nutrition. And um, that's one reason that I believe that uh, creation account is so hated and so despised, because it addresses the evolutionist, the sexual perversionist, the abortionist, the environmentalist. All of those things are addressed in these two scriptures in the Word of God. But I want to go back to the first one, because that's our main thought uh, in our study this evening, and that is man's design. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Now, he made in our nature and in our person, in our personality, uh, a moral capability, a spiritual capability. He gave us emotion and he gave us intellect and conscience and will. And that's what causes us to stand apart from brute beasts. We're not made after the image of animals. We are not an animal. We're not a product of evolving animals, friends. God doesn't begin with man's body and relate it to the beast. God begins with man's moral and spiritual nature and relates it to God. We are akin to God because we are made in his image. We are his offspring, Acts chapter 17 says. So often we get it reversed. You've heard it many times referred to man having a three-part nature that were body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. Because we put the emphasis on the body. But that's not the way the Bible reads it. The Bible never uses it in that order. In fact, when Paul said, spoke about it, he said, I pray that God preserve you spirit, soul, and body unto the day of his coming. Not body, soul, and spirit, but spirit, soul, and body. And it's the spirit and the soul aspect that makes us kin to God, especially the spiritual side. In fact, when it comes down to man's body being discussed in creation, it's just a little footnote at the end of the creation story in Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God formed man of the dust of the ground. There was a little girl that uh, went to her mother, and she said, Mother, we learned in Sunday school today that we came from dust and that we're going back to dust. Is that true? And the mother responded, Yes, darling, that's true. The little girl said, Well, I just looked under the bed, and someone's either coming or going. And we are made of the dust of the ground, physically speaking. But in our spirit, we bear the image of God. In our will, in, in our emotions, in our spiritual and moral capacity, that's what it makes us stand out from all of the animal kingdom. John Phillips put it this way, and I thought it was worth reading. He said, man is no way related to the beasts. What animals, what animal rather can transmit accumulated achievements from one generation to another. What animal experiences a true sense of guilt when it does wrong or has developed a consciousness of judgment to come? What animal shows any desire to worship? What animal has hope of immortality beyond the grave? What beast can exercise abstract moral judgment or show appreciation for the beauties of nature? When did we ever see a dog admiring a sunset or a horse standing breathless before the rugged grandeur of a mountain range? What animal ever learned to read or write, to act with deliberate purpose, to set goals and achieve long-range objectives? What animal ever learned to cook its food or cut cloth or make clothes or invent elaborate tools? What animal ever enjoyed a hearty laugh? What animal has a gift for speech? Even the most primitive human tribe possesses linguistics of a subtle, complex, and eloquent nature. And he went on to say this, Man stands alone physically. He alone, of all creatures on the globe, walks uprightly. Mentally, his manner, he alone has the ability to communicate in a sophisticated way. Spiritually, he alone has the capacity to know the mind and will of God. So physically, mentally, spiritually, we're head and shoulders above the animal kingdom because we have been made in the image of God. John Blanchard said this, if man was not created by God in God's image, he has no more inherent dignity than a donkey. We're not made out of monkeys. And we've got more dignity than a donkey. We've been made to walk upright where we can have a communication with God and a relationship with God and a union for God. Man was made for union and communion with the Creator. It was Clement of Alexandria that said, man is born to have connection with God, intimately, personally, deeply connected with God. One of my favorite authors for many, many years, for over 40 years, has been A.W. Tozer, and I've mined his books through these years. I think I have probably all of his books. And there was one book that was some of his editorials, and it was titled, Man, the Dwelling Place of God. In the first chapter, it was the editorial that was titled, Man, the Dwelling Place of God. And I want to read just a portion or two from this brief little editorial. He said, deep inside every man, there is a private sanctum where dwells the mysterious essence of his being. This far in reality that is in the man, which is what in and of itself, without reference to any other part of the man's nature, is what is man's I am, a gift from the I am who created him. The I am which is God, underived and self-existent, the I am which is man, derived from God and dependent, every moment upon his creative fiat for its continued existence. God made us with that inner sanctum, that spirit where God can come and dwell. He gave a little tiny I am to us so his great I am can come and flood the little I am that is in you and I. And that's been his plan and his purpose all along in making Adam in creating the human race. It was lost in Adam. It was lost in the fall. The image of God was marred when Adam sinned. 1 Corinthians uh, 12 and 11 is cited by Tozer. For what man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit 
of God. There's only certain things that can, that can be known and known in the inside, deep within us, in the spirit of man. And the only way you can know God is spiritually, for God to reveal himself by the Holy Spirit. And then he went on, Tozer did, to say that uh, this knowing God and self-knowledge of God and this acquaintance with God and this union and communion with God, it reveals the essential spirituality of mankind. It denies that man is a creature having a spirit and declares that he is a spirit having a body, which makes him a human being, not in his body, but in his spirit, which is in the image of God. That's where it originally lays. The image of God is how God made us from the inside out. From man's standpoint, Tozer continued, and I'm reading just portions of this, the most tragic loss suffered in the fall was the vacating of the inner sanctum by the Spirit of God at the far hidden center of man's being is a bush fitted to be the dwelling place of the triune God. God made us to dwell in us, to be a habitation of God through the Spirit, to be temples of the Holy Ghost. And then he went on and mentioned how that Jesus will only come in by invitation. He quotes Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. We will have an intimate relationship as I come into him, as I take up residence in him, as Christ comes to restore the image of God in humanity. And then he quotes Romans 8 and 9, If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he has none of his. And again, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Such a one is a true Christian and only such. We're not a Christian because we've been baptized or because we've been confirmed or because we've joined a church or signed a roll or taken uh, place uh, part in sacraments and so on and so forth. None of these mean anything unless there is a true relationship with God. And many, many just settle for religion instead of a relationship. And it's a relationship that takes up residence within our heart. So what does it mean to you, to you personally, that you were made in the image and likeness of God. Have you ever really thought about that? I want you to contemplate that question because I want you watching on Facebook to make some comments on that. Again, what does it mean to you that you were made in the image of God? And then secondly, what things would you logically think would be expected from someone who is made in the image of God? If we declare we're made in the image of God, we should see God's image, shouldn't we? We should see a God-likeness, a God quality. We should see the uh, attributes of God or the characteristics of God or the fruit of God's righteousness and holiness in our life. We should see the fruit of Christ dwelling in us, the fruit of the Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ living in us and living through us. Yes, the world opposes the idea of man being made in the image of God because they oppose God. They oppose Jesus. And the one answer for all the things that we're dealing with today, all of the problems that we're facing, the crisis situations that's confronting our world, and in America in particular, in this uh, highly charged society that we're living in politically and socially, friends, the very thing that we need, the answer to it all is Christ. But he's the one that's trying to be banned. That They're trying to banish Jesus, silence the church, uh, do away with the Bible, the very answer to our dilemmas. And as we study this, we'll see how God wants to work through us and make us, by his working, uh, a part of the solution. And it's the only way that there could be a solution. You take God out of the equation and our goose is cooked. We're done. Civilization will rot and uh, be destroyed. So understand that um, we are made in his image. And let's not confuse people by claim, claiming to be a Christian and people not seeing Christ where we're living. Let's not leave them disillusioned and leave them disappointed because we're professing something that we're not actually possessing. But let's pray that we can learn in this study what the Christ life, Christ dwelling in us, all of him and all of me really looks like and how to apply these 
powerful transformational truths in our everyday living, not just Sunday to Sunday, not just day by day, but moment by moment, how to cultivate that, how to tap into the endless resource that is Jesus Christ. So again, next week, we're going to be looking at chapters 2, 3, and 4 together, do a brief uh, survey of those as we continue on the indwelling life of Christ. Now, as I mentioned, we have a book that's available for all of you watching on Facebook, a free complimentary copy of The Indwelling Life of Christ. In order for you to get one, all you need to do is to call the church office uh, Monday through Thursday between 8 and 4, and the number at Trinity is 731-852-4477. 731-852-4477. And we'll rush a copy. You mail it right to you, and then you could follow along in the book. Our objective is to get this book out to as many people as we can because we really feel this is foundational. This is basic Christianity essential Christianity. And I really truly believe if we don't get this, we don't get the gospel. It's just that important of a book written by a saintly, godly man who preached these truths for over 70 years, Major Ian Thomas. So make some comments and uh, some observations on Facebook and we'll reply and we'll get some dialogue going just like we're doing live in person here at the church at 6.30 on Wednesday nights. All right, we'll look forward to next week. Until then, God bless you.